call it the Stargate. For three million years, it had circled Saturn, waiting for a moment of destiny that might never come. In its making, a moon had been shattered, and the debris of its creation orbited still. Now the long wait was ending. On yet another world, intelligence had been born and was escaping from its planetary cradle. An ancient experiment was about to reach its climax. Those who had begun that experiment so long ago had not been men or even remotely human. But they were flesh and blood, and when they looked out across the deeps of space, they had felt awe and wonder and loneliness. As soon as they possessed the power, they set forth for the stars. In their explorations, they encountered life in many forms, and watched the workings of evolution on a thousand worlds. They saw how often the first faint sparks of intelligence flickered and died in the cosmic night. And because in all the galaxy, they had found nothing more precious than mind. They encouraged its dawning everywhere. They became farmers in the fields of stars. They sowed, and sometimes they reaped. And sometimes, dispassionately, they had to weed. The great dinosaurs had long since perished when the survey ship entered the solar system after a voyage that already lasted a thousand years. It swept past the frozen outer planets, paused briefly above the deserts of dying Mars, and presently looked down on Earth. Spread out beneath them, the explorers saw worlds swarming with life. For years they studied, collected, catalogued. When they had learned all that they could, they began to modify. They tinkered with the destiny of many species, on land and in the ocean. But which of their experiments would succeed, they could not know for at least a million years. They were patient, but they were not yet immortal. There was so much to do in this universe of a hundred billion suns, and other worlds were calling. So they set out once more into the abyss, knowing that they would never come this way again. Nor was there any need. The servants they had left behind would do the rest. On earth, the glaciers came and went, while above them the changeless moon still carried its secret. With a yet slower rhythm than the polar ice, the tides of civilization ebbed and flowed across the galaxy. Strange and beautiful and terrible empires rose and fell and passed on the knowledge to their successors. Earth was not forgotten, but another visit would serve little purpose. It was one of a million silent worlds, few of which would ever speak. And now, out among the stars, evolution was driving towards new goals. The first explorers of Earth had long since come to the limits of flesh and blood. As soon as their machines were better than their bodies, it was time to move. First their brains, and then their thoughts alone, they transferred into shining new homes of metal and of plastic. In these, they roamed among the stars. They no longer built spaceships. They were spaceships. But the age of the machine entities swiftly passed. In their ceaseless experimenting, they had learned to store knowledge in the structure of space itself and to preserve their thoughts for eternity in frozen lattices of light. They could become creatures of radiation, free at last from the tyranny of matter. Into pure energy, therefore, they pleasantly transformed themselves, and on a thousand worlds the empty shells they had discarded twitched for a while in a mindless dance of death, then crumbled into rust. Now they were lords of the galaxy, and beyond the reach of time. They could rove at will among the stars, and sink like a subtle mist through the very interstices of space, but despite their godlike powers, they had not wholly forgotten their origin in the warm slime of a vanished sea. And they still watched over the experiments their ancestors had started so long ago. The air in the ship is getting quite foul, and I have a headache most of the time. There's still plenty of oxygen, but the purifiers never really cleaned up all the messes after the liquids aboard started boiling into vacuum. When things get too bad, I go down to the garage and bleed off some pure oxygen from the pods. There's been no reaction to any of my signals, and because of my orbital inclination, I'm getting slowly further and further away from TMA2. Incidentally, the name you've given it is doubly inappropriate. There's still no trace of a magnetic field. At the moment, my closest approach is 60 miles. It will increase to about 100 as the apertus rotates beneath me, then drop back to zero. I'll pass directly over the thing in 30 days, but that's too long to wait, and then it will be in darkness anyway. 
Even now, it's only in sight for a few minutes before it falls below the horizon again. It's damn frustrating. I can't make any serious observations. So I'd like your approval of this plan. The space pods have ample delta V for a touchdown and a return to the ship. I want to go extra vehicle and make a close survey of the object. If it appears safe, I'll land beside it, or even on top of it. The ship will still be above my horizon while I'm going down, so I won't be out of touch for more than 90 minutes. I'm convinced that this is the only thing to do. I've come a billion miles. I don't want to be stopped by the last 60. For weeks, as it stared forever sunward with its strange senses, the Stargate had watched the approaching ship. Its makers had prepared it for many things, and this was one of them. It recognized what was climbing up towards it from the warm heart of the solar system. If it had been alive, it would have felt excitement, but such an emotion was wholly beyond its powers. Even if the ship had passed it by, it would not have known the slightest trace of disappointment. It had waited three million years. It was prepared to wait for eternity. It observed and noted and took no action as the visitor checked its speed with jets of incandescent gas. Presently it felt the gentle touch of radiations trying to probe its secrets. And still it did nothing. Now the ship was in orbit, circling low above the surface of this strangely piebald moon. It began to speak with blasts of radio waves, counting out the prime numbers from 1 to 11 over and over again. Soon these gave way to more complex signals at many frequencies, ultraviolet, infrared, X-rays. The Stargate made no reply. It had nothing to say. There was a long pause then before it observed that something was falling down towards it from the orbiting ship. It searched its memories and the logic circuits made their decisions according to the orders given them long ago. Beneath the cold light of Saturn, the Stargate awakened its slumbering powers. Discovery looked just as he had last seen her from space, floating in lunar orbit with the moon taking up half the sky. Perhaps there was one slight change. He could not be sure, but some of the paint of her external lettering, announcing the purpose of various hatches, connections, umbilical plugs, and other attachments, it had faded during its long exposure to the unshielded sun. That sun was now an object that no man could have recognized. It was far too bright to be a star, but one could look directly at its tiny disk without discomfort. It gave no heat at all when Bowman held his ungloved hands in its rays as they streamed through the space pod's window. He could feel nothing upon his skin. He might have been trying to warm himself by the light of the moon. Not even the alien landscape fifty miles below reminded him more vividly of his remoteness from Earth. Now he was leaving, perhaps for the last time, the metal world that had been his home for so many months. Even if he never returned, the ship would continue to perform its duty, broadcasting instrument readings back to Earth, until there was some final catastrophic failure in its circuits. And if he did return, well, he could keep alive, and perhaps even sane, for a few more months. But that was all the hibernation systems were useless, with no computer to monitor them. He could not possibly survive until Discovery 2 made its rendezvous with the Apatus, four or five years hence. He put these thoughts behind him, as the golden crescent of Saturn rose in the sky ahead. In all history, he was the only man to have seen this sight. To all other eyes, Saturn had always shown its whole illuminated disk turned full towards the sun. Now it was a delicate bow, with the rings forming a thin line across it, like an arrow about to be loosed into the face of the sun itself. Also in the line of the rings was the bright star of Titan, and the fainter sparks of the other moons. Before this century was half gone, men would have visited them all, but whatever secrets they might hold, he would never know. The sharp-edged boundary of the blind white eye was sweeping towards him. There was only a hundred miles to go, and he would be over his target in less than ten minutes. He wished that there was some way of telling if his words were reaching Earth, now an hour and a half away at the speed of light. It would be the ultimate irony if, through some breakdown in the relay system, he disappeared into silence, and no one ever knew what had happened to him. Discovery was still a brilliant star in the black sky far above. He was pulling ahead as he gained speed during his descent, but soon the pod's breaking jets would slow him down, and the ship would sail on out of sight, leaving him alone on the shining plain with the dark mystery at its center.
block of ebony was climbing above the horizon, eclipsing the stars ahead. He rolled the pod around its gyros and used full thrust to break his orbital speed. In a long, flat arc, he descended towards the surface of Iapetus. On a world of higher gravity, the maneuver would have been far too extravagant a fuel. But here the space pod weighed only a score of pounds. He had several minutes of hovering time before he would cut dangerously into his reserve and be stranded without any hope of return to the still orbiting discovery. Not perhaps that it made much difference. His altitude was still about five miles, and he was heading straight towards the huge dark mass that soared in such geometrical perfection above the featureless plain. It was as blank as a flat white surface beneath. Until now, he had not appreciated how enormous it really was. There were very few single buildings on Earth as large as this. His carefully measured photographs indicated a height of almost 2,000 feet, and as far as could be judged, its proportions were precisely the same as TMA-1's, that curious ratio 1 to 4 to 9. I'm only three miles away now, holding altitude at 4,000 feet. Still not a sign of activity, nothing on any of the instruments. The faces seem absolutely smooth and polished. Surely you'd expect some meteorite damage after all this time. And there's no debris on the, well, I suppose you could call it the roof. No sign of an opening either. I've been hoping there might be some way in. Now I'm right above it, hovering 500 feet up. I don't want to waste any time, since discovery will soon be out of range. I'm going to land. It's certainly solid enough, and if it isn't, I'll blast off at once. Just a minute. That's odd. Bowman's voice died into the silence of utter bewilderment. He was not alarmed. He literally could not describe what he was seeing. He had been hanging above a large, flat rectangle, 800 feet long and 200 wide, made of something that looked as solid as rock. But now it seemed to be receding from him. It was exactly like one of those optical illusions when a three-dimensional object can, by an effort of will, appear to turn inside out, its near and far sides suddenly interchanging. That was happening to this huge, apparently solid structure. Impossibly, incredibly, it was no longer a monolith rearing high above a flat plain. What had seemed to be its roof had dropped away to infinite depths, for one dizzy moment, he seemed to be looking down a vertical shaft, a rectangular duct which defied the laws of perspective, for its size did not decrease with distance. The eye of Iapetus had blinked, as if to remove an irritating speck of dust. David Bowman had time for just one broken sentence, which awaiting men in mission control, 900 million miles away and 80 minutes in the future, were never to forget. The thing's hollow, it goes on forever, and, oh my God, it's full of stars. The stargate opened. The stargate closed. In a moment of time too short to be measured, space turned and twisted upon itself. Then Iapetus was once more alone, as it had been for three million years, alone except for a deserted but not yet derelict ship, sending back to its makers messages which they could neither believe nor understand. There was no sense of motion, but he was falling towards those impossible stars, shining there in the dark heart of a moon. No, that was not where they really were, he felt certain. He wished, now that it was far too late, that he had paid more attention to those theories of hyperspace, of trans-dimensional ducts. To David Bowman, they were theories no longer. Perhaps that monolith on Iapetus was hollow. Perhaps the roof was only an illusion or some kind of diaphragm that had opened to let him through. But into what? As far as he could trust his senses, he appeared to be dropping vertically down a huge rectangular shaft several thousand feet deep. He was moving faster and faster, but the far end never changed its size and remained always at the same distance from him. Only the stars moved, at first so slowly that it was some time before he realized that they were escaping out of the frame that held them. But in a little while it was obvious that the star field was expanding, as if it was rushing towards him at an inconceivable speed. The expansion was non-linear. The stars at the center hardly seemed to move, while those towards the edge accelerated more and more swiftly, until they became streaks of light, just before they vanished from view. There were always others to replace them, flowing into the center of the field from an apparently inexhaustible source. 
Bowman wondered what would happen if a star came straight towards him. Would it continue to expand until he plunged directly into the face of a sun? But not one came near enough to show a disk. Eventually they all veered aside and streaked over the edge of their rectangular frame. And still the far end of the shaft came no closer. It was almost as if the walls were moving with him, carrying him to his unknown destination. Or perhaps he was really motionless, and space was moving past him. Not only space, he suddenly realized, was involved in whatever was happening to him now. The clock on the pod's small instrument panel was also behaving strangely. Normally, the numbers in the tenths of a second window flickered past so quickly that it was almost impossible to read them. Now they were appearing and disappearing at discrete intervals, and he could count them off one by one without difficulty. The seconds themselves were passing with incredible slowness, as if time itself were coming to a stop. At last, the tenth of a second counter froze between five and six. Yet he could still think, and even observe, as the ebon walls flowed past at a speed that might have been anything between zero and a million times the velocity of light. Somehow, he was not in the least surprised, nor was he alarmed. On the contrary, he felt a sense of calm expectation, such as he had once known when the space medics had tested him with hallucinogenic drugs. The world around him was strange and wonderful, but there was nothing to fear. He had travelled these millions of miles in search of mystery, and now, it seemed, the mystery was coming to him. The rectangle ahead was growing lighter. The luminous star streaks were paling against a milky sky, whose brilliance increased moment by moment. It seemed as if the space pod was heading towards a bank of cloud, uniformly illuminated by the rays of an invisible sun. He was emerging from the tunnel. The far end, which until now had remained at that same indeterminate distance, neither approaching nor receding, had suddenly started to obey the normal laws of perspective. It was coming closer and steadily widening before him. At the same time, he felt that he was moving upward, and for a fleeting instant he wondered if he had fallen right through the apatus and was now ascending from the other side. But even before the space pod soared out into the open, he knew that this place had nothing to do with the apatus or with any world within the experience of man. There was no atmosphere, for he could see all details unblurred, clear down to an incredibly remote and flat horizon. He must be above a world of enormous size, perhaps one much larger than Earth. Yet despite its extent, all the surface that Bowman could see was tessellated into obviously artificial patterns that must have been miles on a side. It was like the jigsaw puzzle of a giant that played with planets, and at the centres of many of those squares and triangles and polygons were gaping black shafts, twins of the chasm from which he had just emerged. Yet the sky above was stranger, and in its way more disturbing than even the improbable land beneath. For there were no stars, neither was there the blackness of space. There was only a softly glowing milkiness that gave the impression of infinite distance. Bowman remembered a description he had once heard of the dreaded Antarctic whiteout, like being inside a ping-pong ball. Those words could be applied perfectly to this weird place, but the explanation must be utterly different. This sky could be no meteorological effect of mist and snow. There was a perfect vacuum here. Then, as Bowman's eyes grew accustomed to the nacreous glow that filled the heavens, he became aware of another detail. The sky was not, as he had thought at first glance, completely empty. Dotted overhead, quite motionless, and forming apparently random patterns, were myriads of tiny black specks. They were difficult to see, for they were mere points of darkness, but once detected they were quite unmistakable. They reminded Bowman of something, something so familiar, yet so insane, that he refused to accept the parallel until logic forced it upon him. Those black holes in the white sky were stars. He might have been looking at a photographic negative of the Milky Way. Where in God's name am I? Bowman asked himself, and even as he posed the question, he felt certain that he could never know the answer. It seemed that space had been turned inside out. This was not a place for man. Though the capsule was comfortably warm, he felt suddenly cold and was afflicted by an almost uncontrollable trembling. He wanted to close his eyes and shut out the pearly nothingness that surrounded him, 
but that was the act of a coward, and he would not yield to it. The pierced and faceted planet slowly rolled beneath him without any real change of scenery. He guessed he was about ten miles above the surface and should be able to see any signs of life with ease. But this whole world was deserted. Intelligence had come here, worked its will upon it, and gone its way again. Then he noticed, humped above the flat plain, perhaps twenty miles away, a roughly cylindrical pile of debris that could only be the carcass of a gigantic ship. It was too distant for him to see any details, and it passed out of sight within a few seconds, but he could make out broken ribs and dully gleaming sheets of metal that had been partly peeled off, like the skin of an orange. He wondered how many thousands of years the wreck had lain here on its deserted checkerboard, and what manner of creatures had sailed it between the stars. Then he forgot the derelict, for something was coming up over the horizon. At first it looked like a flat disk, but that was because it was heading almost directly towards him. As it approached and passed beneath, he saw that it was spindle-shaped and several hundred feet long. Though there were faintly visible bands here and there along its length, it was hard to focus upon them. The object appeared to be vibrating, or perhaps spinning, at a very rapid rate. It tapered to a point at either end, and there was no sign of propulsion. Only one thing about it was familiar to human eyes, and that was its color. If it was indeed a solid artifact, and not an optical phantom, and its makers perhaps shared some of the emotions of men, but they certainly did not share their limitations, for the spindle appeared to be made of gold. Bowman moved his head to the rear view system to watch the thing drop behind. It had ignored him completely, and now he saw that it was falling out of the sky down towards one of those thousands of great slots. A few seconds later it disappeared in a final flash of gold as it dived into the planet. He was alone again, beneath that sinister sky, and the sense of isolation and remoteness was more overwhelming than ever. Then he saw that he also was sinking down towards the mottled surface of the giant world, and that another of the rectangular chasms yawned immediately below. The empty sky closed above him, the clock crawled to rest, and once again his pod was falling between infinite ebon walls towards another distant patch of stars. But now he was sure that he was not returning to the solar system, and in a flash of insight that might have been wholly spurious, he knew what this thing must surely be. It was some kind of cosmic switching device, routing the traffic of the stars through unimaginable dimensions of space and time. He was passing through a grand central station of the galaxy. Far ahead, the walls of the slot were becoming dimly visible once more, in the faint light diffusing downward from some still hidden source. And then the darkness was abruptly whipped away as a tiny space spot hurtled upward into a sky ablaze with stars. He was back in space as he knew it, but a single glance told him that he was light centuries from Earth. He did not even attempt to find any of the familiar constellations that since the beginning of history had been the friends of man. Perhaps none of the stars that now blazed around him had ever been seen by the unaided human eye. Most of them were concentrated in a glowing belt, broken here and there with dark bands of obscuring cosmic dust which completely circled the sky. It was like the Milky Way, but scores of times brighter. Bowman wondered if this was indeed his own galaxy, seen from a point much closer to its brilliant crowded center. He hoped that it was, then he would not be so far from home. But this, he realized at once, was a childish thought. He was so inconceivably remote from the solar system that it made little difference whether he was in his own galaxy or the most distant one that any telescope had ever glimpsed. He looked back to see the thing from which he was rising and had another shock. Here was no giant, multifaceted world, nor any duplicate of Iapetus. There was nothing except an inky shadow against the stars, like a doorway opening from a darkened room into a still darker night. Even as he watched, that doorway closed. It did not recede from him. It slowly filled with stars, as if a rent in the fabric of space had been repaired. Then he was alone beneath the alien sky. The space pod was slowly turning, and as it did so it brought fresh wonders into view. First there was a perfectly spherical swarm of stars, becoming more and more closely packed towards the center, until its heart was a continuous glow of light. 
Its outer edges were ill-defined, a slowly thinning halo of suns that merged imperceptibly into the background of more distant stars. This glorious apparition, Bowman knew, was a globular cluster. He was looking upon something that no human eye had ever seen, save as a smudge of light in the field of a telescope. He could not remember the distance to the nearest known cluster, but he was sure that there were none within a thousand light years of the solar system. The pod continued its slow rotation to disclose an even stranger sight, a huge red sun many times larger than the moon as seen from Earth. Bowman could look straight into its face without discomfort. Judging by its color, it was no hotter than a glowing coal. Here and there, set into the somber red, were rivers of bright yellow, incandescent Amazons, meandering for thousands of miles before they lost themselves in the deserts of this dying sun. Dying? No. That was a wholly false impression, born of human experience and the emotions aroused by the hues of sunset or the glow of fading embers. This was a star that had left behind the fiery extravagances of its youth, had raced through the violets and blues and greens of the spectrum in a few fleeting billions of years, and had now settled down to a peaceful maturity of unimaginable length. All that had gone before was not a thousandth of what was yet to come. The story of this star had barely begun. The pot had ceased to roll. The great red sun lay straight ahead. Though there was no sense of motion, Bowman knew that he was still gripped by whatever controlling force had brought him here from Saturn. All the science and engineering skill of Earth seemed hopelessly primitive now against the powers that were carrying him to some unimaginable fate. He stared into the sky ahead, trying to pick out the goal towards which he was being taken, perhaps some planet circling this great sun. But there was nothing that showed any visible disk or exceptional brightness. If there are planets orbiting here, he could not distinguish them from the stellar background. Then he noticed that something strange was happening on the very edge of this sun's crimson disk. A white glow had appeared there and was rapidly waxing in brilliance. He wondered if he was seeing one of those sudden eruptions or flares that trouble most stars from time to time. The light became brighter and bluer. It began to spread along the edge of the sun, whose blood-red hues paled swiftly by comparison. It was almost, Bowman told himself, smiling at the absurdity of the thought, as if you were watching sunrise on a sun. And so indeed he was. Above the burning horizon lifted something no larger than a star, but so brilliant that the eye could not bear to look upon it. A mere point of blue-white radiance, like an electric arc, was moving at unbelievable speed across the face of the great sun. It must be very close to its giant companion, for immediately below it, drawn upward by its gravitational pull, was a column of flame thousands of miles high. It was as if a tidal wave of fire was marching forever along the equator of this star in vain pursuit of the searing apparition in its sky. That pinpoint of incandescence must be a white dwarf, one of those strange, fierce little stars, no larger than the Earth, yet containing a million times its mass. Such ill-matched stellar couples were not uncommon, but Moman had never dreamed that one day he would see such a pair with his own eyes. The white dwarf had transited almost half the disk of its companion. It must take only minutes to make its complete orbit, when Bowman was at last certain that he too was moving. Ahead of him, one of the stars was becoming rapidly brighter and was beginning to drift against its background. It must be some small, close body, perhaps the world towards which he was traveling. It was upon him with unexpected speed, and he saw that it was not a world at all. A dully gleaming cobweb or latticework of metal, hundreds of miles in extent, grew out of nowhere until it filled the sky. Scattered across its continent-wide surface were structures that must have been as large as cities, but which appeared to be machines. Around many of these were assembled scores of smaller objects, ranged in neat rows and columns. Bowman had passed several such groups before he realized that they were fleets of spaceships. He was flying over a gigantic orbital parking lot. Because there were no familiar objects by which you could judge the scale of the scene flashing by below, it was almost impossible to estimate the size of the vessels hanging there in space. But they were certainly enormous. Some must have been miles in length. 
They were of many different designs, spheres, faceted crystals, slim pencils, ovoid discs. This must be one of the meeting places for the commerce of the stars, or it had been perhaps a million years ago, for nowhere could Bowman see any sign of activity. This sprawling spaceport was as dead as the moon. He knew it not only by the absence of all movement, but by such unmistakable signs as great gaps torn in the metal cobweb by the wasp-like blunderings of asteroids that must have smashed through it aeons ago. This was no longer a parking lot. It was a cosmic junk heap. He had missed its builders by ages, and with that realization Bowman felt a sudden sinking of his heart. Though he had not known what to expect, at least he had hoped to meet some intelligence from the stars. Now it seemed he was too late. He had been caught in an ancient automatic trap set for some unknown purpose and still operating when its makers had long since passed away. It had swept him across the galaxy and dumped him with how many others in this celestial sargasso, doomed soon to die when his air was exhausted. Well, it was unreasonable to expect more. Already he had seen wonders for which many men would have sacrificed their lives. He thought of his dead companions. He had no cause for complaint. Then he saw that the derelict spaceport was still sliding past him with undiminished speed. He was sweeping over its outlying suburbs. Its ragged edge went by and no longer partly eclipsed the stars. In a few more minutes it had fallen behind. His fate did not lie here, but far ahead, in the huge crimson sun, towards which the space pod was now unmistakably falling. Now there was only the red sun, filling the sky from side to side. He was so close that its surface was no longer frozen into immobility by sheer scale. There were luminous nodules moving to and fro, Cyclones of ascending and descending gas. Prominence is slowly rocketing towards the heavens. Slowly, they must be rising at a million miles an hour for their movement to be visible to his eye. He did not even attempt to grasp the scale of the inferno towards which he was descending. The immensities of Saturn and Jupiter had defeated him during discoveries flyby in that solar system now unknown mega miles away. But everything he saw here was a hundred times larger still he could do nothing but accept the images that were flooding into his mind without attempting to interpret them. As that sea of fire expanded beneath him, Bowman should have known fear, but curiously enough, he now felt only a mild apprehension. It was not that his mind was benumbed with wonders. Logic told him that he must surely be under the protection of some controlling and almost omnipotent intelligence. He was now so close to the red sun that he would have been burned up in a moment if its radiation had not been held at bay by some invisible screen. And during his voyage, he had been subject to accelerations that should have crushed him instantly, yet he had felt nothing. If so much trouble had been taken to preserve him, there was still cause for hope. The space pod was now moving along a shallow arc, almost parallel to the surface of the star, but slowly descending towards it. And now, for the first time, Bowman became aware of sounds, there was a faint, continuous roar, broken from time to time by crackles like tearing paper or distant lightning. This could be only the feeblest echo of an unimaginable cacophony. The atmosphere surrounding him must be racked by concussions that would tear any material object to atoms. Yet he was protected from this shattering tumult as effectively as from the heat. Though ridges of flame thousands of miles high were rising and slowly collapsing around him, he was completely insulated from all this violence. The energies of the star raved past him, as if they were in another universe. The pod moved sedately through their mist, unbuffeted and unscorched. Bowman's eyes, no longer hopelessly confused by the strangeness and grandeur of the scene, began to pick out details which must have been there before, but which he had not yet perceived. The surface of this star was no formless chaos, there was pattern here, as in everything that nature created. He noticed first the little whirlpools of gas, probably no larger than Africa or Asia, that wandered over the surface of the star. Sometimes he could look directly down into one of them to see darker, cooler regions far below. Curiously enough, there appeared to be no sunspots. Perhaps they were diseases peculiar to the star that shone on Earth. 
and there were occasional clouds, like wisps of smoke blown before a gale. Perhaps they were indeed smoke, for this sun was so cold that real fire could exist here. Chemical compounds could be born and could live for a few seconds before they were again ripped apart by the fiercer nuclear violence that surrounded them. The horizon was growing brighter, its color changing from gloomy red to yellow to blue to blistering violet. The white dwarf was coming up over the horizon, dragging its tidal wave of star stuff behind it. Bowman shielded his eyes from the intolerable glare of the little sun and focused on the troubled starscape which his gravitational field was sucking skyward. Once he had seen a water spout moving across the face of the Caribbean, this tower of flame had almost the same shape. Only the scale was slightly different, for at its base the column was probably wider than the planet Earth. And then, immediately beneath him, Bowman noticed something which was surely new, since he could hardly have overlooked it if it had been there before. Moving across the ocean of glowing gas were myriads of bright beads, they shone with a pearly light which waxed and waned in a period of a few seconds. And they were all traveling in the same direction, like salmon moving upstream. Sometimes they weaved back and forth so that their paths intertwined, but they never touched. There were thousands of them, and the longer Bowman stared, the more convinced he became that their motion was purposeful. They were too far away for him to make out any details of their structure, that he could see them at all in this colossal panorama meant that they must be scores, perhaps hundreds, of miles across. If they were organized entities, they were leviathans indeed, built to match the scale of the world they inhabited. Perhaps they were only clouds of plasma, given temporary stability by some odd combination of natural forces, like the short-lived spheres of ball lightning that still puzzled terrestrial scientists. That was an easy, and perhaps soothing, explanation. But as Bowman looked down upon that star-wide streaming, he could not really believe it. Those glittering nodes of light knew where they were going. They were deliberately converging upon the pillar of fire raised by the white dwarf as it orbited overhead. Bowman stared once more at that ascending column, now marching along the horizon beneath the tiny, massive star that ruled it. Could it be pure imagination, or were there patches of brighter luminosity creeping up that great geyser of gas, as if myriads of shining sparks had combined into whole continents of phosphorescence. The idea was almost beyond fantasy, but perhaps he was watching nothing less than a migration from star to star across a bridge of fire. Whether it was a movement of mindless cosmic beasts driven across space by some lemming-like urge, or a vast concourse of intelligent entities, he would probably never know. He was moving through a new order of creation, of which few men had ever dreamed. Beyond the realms of sea and land and air and space lay the realms of fire, which he alone had been privileged to glimpse. It was too much to expect that he would also understand. The pillar of fire was marching over the edge of the sun, like a storm passing beyond the horizon. The scurrying flecks of light no longer moved across the redly glowing starscape, still thousands of miles below. Inside his space pod, protected from an environment that could annihilate him within a millisecond, David Bowman awaited whatever had been prepared. The white dwarf was sinking fast as it hurtled along its orbit. Presently it touched the horizon, set it aflame, and disappeared. A false twilight fell upon the inferno beneath, and in the sudden change of illumination, Bowman became aware that something was happening in the space around him. The world of the red sun seemed to ripple, as if you were looking at it through running water. For a moment he wondered if this was some refractive effect, perhaps caused by the passage of an unusually violent shockwave through the tortured atmosphere in which he was immersed. The light was fading. It seemed that a second twilight was about to fall. Involuntarily, Bowman looked upward, then checked himself sheepishly, as he remembered that here the main source of light was not the sky, but the blazing world below. It seemed as if walls of some material, like smoked glass, were thickening around him, cutting out the red glow and obscuring the view. It became darker and darker. The faint roar of the stellar hurricanes also faded out. The space pod was floating in silence and in night. A moment later, there was the softest of bumps as it settled on some hard surface and came to rest. 
To rest on what? Bowman asked himself incredulously. Then light returned, and incredulity gave way to a heart-sinking despair. As he saw what lay around him, he knew that he must be mad. He was prepared, he had thought, for any wonder. The only thing he had never expected was the utterly commonplace. The space pod was resting on the polished floor of an elegant, anonymous hotel suite that might have been any large city on earth. He was staring into a living room with a coffee table, a divan, a dozen chairs, a writing desk, various lamps, a half-full bookcase with some magazines lying on it, and even a bowl of flowers. Van Gogh's Bridget Arles was hanging on one wall, Wyeth's Christian's World on another. He felt confident that when he pulled open the drawer of that desk, he would find a Gideon Bible inside it. If he was indeed mad, his delusions were beautifully organized. Everything was perfectly real. Nothing vanished when he turned his back. The only incongruous element in the scene, and that's certainly a major one, was the space pot itself. For many minutes, Bowman did not move from his seat. He half expected the vision around him to go away, but it remained as solid as anything he had ever seen in his life. It was real, or else a phantom of the senses, so superbly contrived that there was no way of distinguishing it from reality. Perhaps it was some kind of test. If so, not only his fate, but that of the human race might well depend upon his actions in the next few minutes. He could sit here and wait for something to happen, or he could open the pod and step outside to challenge the reality of the scene around him. The floor appeared to be solid, at least it was bearing the weight of the space pod. He was not likely to fall through it, whatever it might really be. But there was still the question of air. For all that he could tell, this room might be in a vacuum, or might contain a poisonous atmosphere. He thought it very unlikely. No one would go to all this trouble without attending to such an essential detail. But he did not propose to take unnecessary risks. In any event, his years of training made him wary of contamination. He was reluctant to expose himself to an unknown environment until he knew that there was no alternative. This place looked like a hotel room somewhere in the United States. That did not alter the fact that in reality he must be hundreds of light years from the solar system. He closed the helmet of his suit, sealing himself in, and actuated the hatch of the space pod. There was a brief hiss of pressure equalization, then he stepped out into the room. As far as he could tell, he was in a perfectly normal gravity field. He raised one arm, then let it fall freely. It flopped to his side in less than a second. That made everything seem doubly unreal. Here he was wearing a spacesuit, standing, when he should have been floating, outside a vehicle which could only function properly in the absence of gravity. All his normal astronaut's reflexes were upset. He had to think before he made every movement. Like a man in a trance, he walked slowly from his bare, unfurnished half of the room towards the hotel suite. He did not, as he had almost expected, disappear as he approached, but remained perfectly real and apparently perfectly solid. There were two doors that opened readily enough. The first one took him into a small but comfortable bedroom, fitted with a bed, bureau, two chairs, light switches that actually worked, and a clothes closet. He opened this and found himself looking at four suits, a dressing gown, a dozen white shirts, and several sets of underwear, all neatly draped from hangers. Without further hesitation, he walked into the bedroom and began to undo the clamp of his helmet. When it was loose, he lifted the helmet a fraction of an inch, cracked the seal, and took a cautious sniff. As far as he could tell, he was breathing perfectly normal air. He dropped the helmet on the bed and began thankfully and rather stiffly to divest himself of his suit. When he had finished, he stretched, took a few deep breaths, and carefully hung the spacesuit up among the more conventional articles of clothing in the closet. It looked rather odd there that the compulsive tidiness that Bowman shared with all astronauts would never have allowed him to leave it anywhere else. He had learned all that he wished to for the moment. He was physically and emotionally exhausted, yet it seemed impossible that one could sleep in such fantastic surroundings and further from Earth than any man in history had ever been. But the comfortable bed and the instinctive wisdom of the body conspired together against his will. He fumbled for the light switch, and the room was plunged into darkness. 
Within seconds, he had passed beyond the reach of dreams. So, for the last time, David Bowman slept. There being no further use for it, the furniture of the suite dissolved back into the mind of its creator. Only the bed remained, and the walls, shielding this fragile organism from the energies it could not yet control. In his sleep, David Bowman stirred restlessly. He did not wake, nor did he dream, but he was no longer wholly unconscious. Like a fog creeping through a forest, something invaded his mind. He sensed it only dimly, for the full impact would have destroyed him as surely as the fires raging beyond these walls. Beneath that dispassionate scrutiny, he felt neither hope nor fear. All emotion had been leached away. He seemed to be floating in free space, while around him stretched, in all directions, an infinite geometrical grid of dark lines or threads along which moved tiny nodes of light, some slowly, some at dazzling speed. Once he had peered through a microscope at a cross-section of a human brain, and in its network of nerve fibers had glimpsed the same labyrinthine complexity, but that had been dead and static, whereas this transcended life itself. He knew, or believed he knew, that he was watching the operation of some gigantic mind, contemplating the universe of which he was so tiny a part. The vision, or illusion, lasted only a moment. Then the crystalline planes and lattices, and the interlocking perspectives of moving light, flickered out of existence as David Bowman moved into a realm of consciousness that no man had experienced before. At first, it seemed that time itself was running backward. Even this marvel he was prepared to accept before he realized the subtler truth. The springs of memory were being tapped. In controlled recollection, he was reliving the past. There was the hotel suite, there the space pod, there the burning starscapes of the red sun, there the shining core of the galaxy, there the gateway to which he had re-emerged into the universe. And not only vision, but all the sense impressions and all the emotions he had felt at the time were racing past more and more swiftly. His life was unreeling, like a tape recorder playing back at ever-increasing speed. Now he was once more aboard the Discovery, and the rings of Saturn filled the sky. Before that, he was repeating his final dialogue with Hal, he was seeing Frank Poole leave on his last mission. He was hearing the voice of Earth, assuring him that all was well. And even as he relived these events, he knew that all indeed was well. He was retrogressing down the corridors of time, being drained of knowledge and experience as he swept backward towards his childhood. But nothing was being lost. All that he had ever been, at every moment of his life, was being transferred to safer keeping. Even as one David Bowman ceased to exist, another became immortal. Faster, faster, he moved back into forgotten years and into a simpler world. The faces he had once loved and had thought lost beyond recall smiled at him sweetly. He smiled back with fondness and without pain. Now, at last, the headlong regression was slackening. The wells of memory were nearly dry. Time flowed more and more sluggishly, approaching a moment of stasis, as a swinging pendulum at the limit of its arc seems frozen for one eternal instant before the next cycle begins. The timeless instant passed. The pendulum reversed its swing. In an empty room, floating amid the fires of a double star 20,000 light years from Earth, a baby opened its eyes and began to cry. Then it became silent as it saw that it was no longer alone. A ghostly, glimmering rectangle had formed in the empty air. It solidified into a crystal tablet, lost its transparency, and became suffused with a pale, milky luminescence. Tantalizing, ill-defined phantoms moved across its surface and in its depths. They coalesced into bars of lights and shadow, then formed intermeshing, spoke patterns that began slowly to rotate in time with a pulsing rhythm that now seemed to fill the whole of space. It was a spectacle to grasp and hold the attention of any child or of any man-ape. But, as it had been three million years before, it was only the outward manifestation of forces too subtle to be consciously perceived. It was merely a toy to distract the senses, while the real processing was carried out at far deeper levels of the mind.
This time the processing was swift and certain, as the new design was woven. For in the A.N. since their last meeting, much had been learned by the weaver, and the material on which he practiced his art was now an infinitely finer texture. But whether it should be permitted to form part of his still-growing tapestry, only the future could tell. With eyes that already held more than human intentness, the baby stared into the depths of the crystal monolith, seeing, but not yet understanding, the mysteries that lay beyond. It knew that it had come home, that here was the origin of many races besides its own, but it knew also that it could not stay. Beyond this moment lay another birth, stranger than any in the past. Now the moment had come. The glowing patterns no longer echoed the secrets in the crystal's heart. As they died, so too the protective walls faded back into the non-existence from which they had briefly emerged, and the red sun filled the sky. The metal and plastic of the forgotten space pod, and the clothing once worn by an entity who had called himself David Bowman, flashed into flame. The last links with Earth were gone, resolved back into the component atoms. But the child scarcely noticed, as he adjusted himself to the comfortable glow of his new environment. He still needed, for a little while, this shell of matter as the focus of his powers. His indestructible body was his mind's present image of itself, and for all his powers, he knew that he was still a baby. So he would remain until he had decided on a new form, or had passed beyond the necessities of matter. And now it was time to go, though in one sense he would never leave this place where he had been reborn for he would always be part of the entity that used this double star for its unfathomable purposes. The direction, though not the nature, of his destiny was clear before him, and there was no need to trace the devious path by which he had come. With the instincts of three million years, he now perceived that there were more ways than one behind the back of space. The ancient mechanisms of the Stargate had served him well, but he would not need them again. The glimmering rectangular shape that had once seemed no more than a slab of crystal still floated before him, indifferent as he was to the harmless flames of the inferno beneath. It encapsulated yet unfathomed secrets of space and time, but some at least he now understood and was able to command. How obvious, how necessary was that mathematical ratio of its sides, the quadratic sequence 1, 4, 9. And how naive to have imagined that the series ended at this point in only three dimensions. He focused his mind upon these geometrical simplicities, and as his thoughts brushed against it, the empty framework filled with the darkness of the interstellar night. The glow of the red sun faded, or rather, seemed to recede in all directions at once, and there before him was the luminous whirlpool of the galaxy. It might have been some beautiful, incredibly detailed model embedded in a block of plastic, but it was the reality, grasped as a whole with senses no more subtle than vision. If he wished, he could focus his attention upon any one of its hundred billion stars, and he could do much more than that. Here he was, adrift in this great river of suns, halfway between the banked fires of the galactic core and the lonely, scattered sentinel stars of the rim. And here he wished to be, on the far side of this chasm in the sky, this serpentine band of darkness, empty of all stars. He knew that this formless chaos, visible only by the glow that limbed its edges from fire mists far beyond, was the still unused stuff of creation, the raw material of evolutions yet to be. Here, time had not begun. Not until the suns that now burned were long since dead would light and life reshape this void. Unwittingly, he had crossed it once. Now he must cross it again, this time of his own volition. The thought filled him with a sudden freezing terror, so that for a moment he was wholly disorientated, and his new vision of the universe trembled and threatened to shatter into a thousand fragments. It was not fear of the galactic gulfs that chilled his soul, but a more profound disquiet, stemming from the unborn future. For he had left behind the time scales of his human origin, now, as he contemplated that band of starless night, he knew the first intimations of the eternity that yawned before him. Then he remembered that he would never again be alone, and his panic slowly ebbed. The crystal-clear perception of the universe was restored to him, 
not he knew wholly by his own efforts. When he needed guidance in his first faltering steps, it would be there. Confident once more, like a high diver who had regained his nerve, he launched himself across the light years. The galaxy burst forth from the mental frame in which he had enclosed it. Stars and nebulae poured past him in an illusion of infinite speed. Phantom suns exploded and fell behind as he slipped like a shadow through their cores. The cold, dark waste of cosmic dust, which he had once feared, seemed no more than the beat of a raven's wing across the face of the sun. The stars were thinning out. The glare of the Milky Way was dimming into a pale ghost of the glory he had known, and, when he was ready, would know again. He was back, precisely where he wished to be, in the space that men called real. There before him, a glittering toy no star child could resist, floated the planet Earth with all its peoples. He had returned in time. Down there on that crowded globe, the alarms would be flashing across the radar screens. The great tracking telescopes would be searching the skies. And history, as men knew it, would be drawing to a close. A thousand miles below, he became aware that a slumbering cargo of death had awoken and was stirring sluggishly in its orbit. The feeble energies it contained were no possible menace to him, but he preferred a cleaner sky. He put forth his will, and the circling megatons flowered in a silent detonation that brought a brief false dawn to half a sleeping globe. Then he waited, marshalling his thoughts and brooding over his still untested powers. For though he was master of the world, he was not quite sure what to do next. But he would think of something. foot telescope, not the 300 meter one. The great saucer, set among the mountains, was already half full of shadow, as a tropical sun dropped swiftly to rest. But the triangular raft of the antenna complex, suspended high above its center, still blazed with light. From the ground far below, it would have taken keen eyes to notice the two human figures in the aerial maze of girders, supporting cables, and waveguides. The time has come, said Dr. Dmitry Mazevich, to his old friend Haywood Floyd, to talk of many things, of shoes and spaceships and sealing wax, but mostly of monoliths and malfunctioning computers. So that's why you got me away from the conference. Not that I really mind. I've heard Carl give that SETI speech so many times I can recite it myself. And the view certainly is fantastic. You know, all the times I've been to Arecibo, 
I've never made it up here to the antenna feed. Shame on you. I've been here three times. Imagine, we're listening to the whole universe, but no one can overhear us. So let's talk about your problem. What problem? To start with, why you had to resign as chairman of the National Council on Astronautics. I didn't resign. The University of Hawaii pays a lot better. Okay, you didn't resign. You were one jump ahead of them. After all these years, Woody, you can't fool me, and you should give up trying. If they offered the NCA back to you right now, would you hesitate? All right, you old Cossack. What do you want to know? First of all, there are lots of loose ends in the report you finally issued after so much prodding. We'll overlook the ridiculous and frankly illegal secrecy with which your people dug up the Tycho monolith. That wasn't my idea. Glad to hear it. I even believe you. And we appreciate the fact that you're now letting everyone examine the thing, which of course is what you should have done in the first place. Not that it's done much good. There was a gloomy silence while the two men contemplated the black enigma up there on the moon, still contemptuously defying all the weapons that human ingenuity could bring to bear upon it. Then the Russian scientist continued, Anyway, whatever the Tycho monolith may be, there's something more important out at Jupiter. That's where it sent its signal, after all. And that's where your people ran into trouble. Sorry about that, by the way. Though Frank Poole was the only one I knew personally. Met him at the 98 IAF Congress. He seemed a good man. Thank you. They were all good men. I wish we knew what happened to them. Whatever it was, surely you'd admit that it now concerns the whole human race, not merely the United States. You can no longer try to use your knowledge for purely national advantage. Dimitri, you know perfectly well that your side would have done exactly the same thing, and you'd have helped. You're absolutely right, but that's ancient history, like the just departed administration of yours that was responsible for the whole mess. With a new president, perhaps wiser counsels will prevail. Possibly. Do you have any suggestions? And are they official, or just personal hopes? Entirely unofficial at the moment, what the bloody politicians call exploratory talks, which I shall flatly deny ever occurred. Fair enough. Go on. Okay, here's the situation. You're assembling Discovery 2 in parking orbit as quickly as you can, but you can't hope to have it ready in less than three years, which means you'll miss the next launch window. I neither confirm nor deny. Remember, I'm merely a humble university chancellor, the other side of the world from the Astronautics Council. And your last trip to Washington was just a holiday to see old friends, I suppose. To continue, our own Alexei Leonov, I thought you were calling it German Titov. Wrong, Chancellor. The dear old CIA's let you down again. Leonov it is, as of last January. And don't let anyone know I told you it will reach Jupiter, at least a year ahead of discovery. Don't let anyone know I told you we were afraid of that. But do go on. Because my bosses are just as stupid and short-sighted as yours, they want to go it alone. Which means that whatever went wrong with you may happen to us, and we'll all be back to square one, or worse. What do you think went wrong? We're just as baffled as you are. And don't tell us you haven't got all of Dave Bowman's transmissions. Of course we have. Right up to that last, my God, it's full of stars. We've even done a stress analysis on his voice patterns. We don't think he was hallucinating. He was trying to describe what he actually saw. And what do you make of his Doppler shift? Completely impossible, of course. When he lost his signal, he was receding at a tenth of the speed of light. And he's reached that in less than two minutes. A quarter of a million gravities. So he must have been killed instantly. Don't pretend to be naive, Woody. Your space pod radios aren't built to withstand even a hundredth of that acceleration. If they could survive, so could Bowman, at least until we lost contact. Just doing an independent check on your deductions. From there on, we're as much in the dark as you are, if you are. Merely playing with lots of crazy guesses, I'd be ashamed to tell you. Yet none of them, I suspect, will be half as crazy as the truth. In small, crimson explosions, the navigation warning lights winked on all around them, 
and the three slim towers supporting the antenna complex began to blaze like beacons against a darkening sky. The last red sliver of the sun vanished below the surrounding hills. Hayward Floyd waited for the green flash, which he had never seen. Once again, he was disappointed. So, Dimitri, he said, let's get to the point. Just what are you driving at? There must be a vast amount of priceless information stored in Discovery's data banks. Presumably it's still been gathered, even though the ship stopped transmitting. We'd like to have that. Fair enough, but when you get out there, and Leonoff makes a rendezvous, what's to prevent you from boarding Discovery and copying everything you want? I never thought I'd have to remind you that Discovery is United States territory, and an unauthorized entry would be piracy except in the event of a life-or-death emergency, which wouldn't be difficult to arrange. After all, it would be hard for us to check what your boys are up to from a billion kilometers away. Thanks for the most interesting suggestion. I'll pass it on. But even if we went aboard, it would take us weeks to learn all your systems and read out all your memory banks. What I propose is cooperation. I'm convinced that's the best idea but we may both have a job selling it to our respective bosses. You want one of our astronauts to fly with Leonov? Yes, preferably an engineer who specialized in discovery systems, like the ones you're training at Houston to bring the ship home. How did you know that? For heaven's sakes, Woody, it was on Aviation Week's video text at least a month ago. I am out of touch. Nobody tells me what's been declassified. All more reason to spend time in Washington. Will you back me up? Absolutely. I agree with you 100%, but... But what? We both have to deal with dinosaurs with brains in their tails. Some of mine will argue, let the Russians risk their necks hurrying out to Jupiter. We'll be there anyway in a couple of years, so what's the hurry? For a moment, there was silence on the antenna raft, except for a faint creak from the immense supporting cables that held it suspended a hundred meters in the sky. Then Mazevich continued, so quietly that Floyd had to strain to hear him, Has anyone checked Discovery's orbit lately? I really don't know, but I suppose so. Anyway, why bother? It's a perfectly stable one. Indeed. Let me tactlessly remind you of an embarrassing incident from the old NASA days. Your first space station, Skylab. It is supposed to stay up at least a decade but you didn't do your calculations right. The air drag in the ionosphere was badly underestimated, and it came down years ahead of schedule. I'm sure you remember that little cliffhanger, even though you were a boy at the time. It was the year I graduated, and you know it. But Discovery doesn't go anywhere near Jupiter. Even at Perigee, or Perigeove, it's much too high to be affected by atmospheric drag. I've already said enough to get me exiled again and you might not be allowed to visit me next time. So just ask your tracking people to do their job more carefully, will you? And remind them that Jupiter has the biggest magnetosphere in the solar system. I understand what you're driving at. Many thanks. Anything else before we go down? I'm starting to freeze. Don't worry, old friend. As soon as you let all this filter through to Washington, wait a week or so until I'm clear. Things are going to get very, very hot. This is Haywood Floyd, aboard cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, on course for Jupiter. But as you can well imagine, all our thoughts are now focused upon Europa. At this very moment, I'm looking at it through the most powerful of the ship's telescopes. Under this magnification, it's ten times larger than the moon, as you see it with the naked eye. It's a really weird sight. The surface is a uniform pink, with a few small brown patches. It's covered with an intricate network of narrow lines, curling and weaving in all directions. In fact, it looks very much like a photo from a medical textbook, showing a pattern of veins and arteries. A few of these features are hundreds, or even thousands, of kilometers long, and look rather like the illusory canals that Percival Lowell and other early 20th century astronomers imagined that they'd seen on Mars. But Europa's canals aren't an illusion, though, of course, they're not artificial. What's more, they do contain water, or at least ice. 
where the satellite is almost entirely covered by ocean, averaging 50 kilometers deep. Because it's so far from the sun, Europa's surface temperature is extremely low, about 150 degrees below freezing. So one might expect its single ocean to be a solid block of ice. Surprisingly, that isn't the case, because there's a lot of heat generated inside Europa by tidal forces, the same forces that drive the great volcanoes on neighboring Io. So the ice is continually melting, breaking up, and freezing, forming cracks and lanes like those in the floating ice sheets in our own polar regions. It's that intricate tracery of cracks I'm seeing now. Most of them are dark and very ancient, perhaps millions of years old. But a few are almost pure white. They're the new ones that have just opened up and have a crust only a few centimeters thick. Chen has landed right beside one of these white streaks, the 1,500-kilometer-long feature that's been christened the Grand Canal. Presumably, the Chinese intend to pump its water into their propellant tanks so that they can explore the Jovian satellite system and then return to Earth. That may not be easy, but they'll certainly have studied the landing site with great care and must know what they're doing. It's obvious now why they've taken such a risk and why they are claiming Europa. As a fueling point, it could be the key to the entire outer solar system. Though there's also water on Ganymede, it's all frozen and also less accessible because of that satellite's more powerful gravity. And there's another point that just occurred to me. Even if the Chinese do get stranded on Europa, they might be able to survive until a rescue mission is arranged. They have plenty of power, there may be useful minerals in the area, and we know that the Chinese are the experts on synthetic food production. It wouldn't be a very luxurious life, but I have some friends who would accept it happily for that staggering view of Jupiter sprawled across the sky, the view we expect to see ourselves in just a few days. This is Haywood Floyd saying goodbye for my colleagues and myself aboard Alexei Leonov. And this is the bridge. Very nice presentation, Haywood. You should have been a newsman. I've had plenty of practice. Half my time was spent on PR work. PR? Public relations. Usually telling politicians why they should give me more money. Something you don't have to bother about. How oh, I wish that was true. Anyway, come up to the bridge. There's some new information we'd like to discuss with you. Floyd removed his button microphone, locked the telescope into position, and extricated himself from the tiny viewing blister. As he left, he almost collided with Nikolai Ternovsky, obviously on a similar mission. I'm about to steal your best quotes for Radio Moscow, Woody. Hope you don't mind. You're welcome, Tavarish. Anyway, how could I stop you? Up on the bridge, Captain Orloff was looking thoughtfully at a dense mass of words and figures on the main display. Floyd started to painfully transliterate these when she interrupted him. Don't worry about the details. These are estimates of the time it will take Chen to refill its tanks and get ready for liftoff. My people are doing the same calculations, but there are far too many variables. We think we've removed one of them. Did you know that the very best water pumps you can buy belong to fire brigades? And would you be surprised to learn that the Peking Central Station had four of its latest models suddenly requisitioned a few months ago, despite the protests of the mayor? I'm not surprised, merely lost in admiration. Go on, please. That may be a coincidence, but those pumps will be just the right size. Making educated guesses about pipe deployment, drilling through the ice, and so on. Well, we think they could lift off again in five days. Five days? If they're lucky, and everything works perfectly, and if they don't wait to fill their propellant tanks, they'd merely take on just enough for a safe rendezvous with discovery before we do. Even if they beat us by a single hour, that would be enough. They could claim salvage rights, at the very least. Not according to the State Department's lawyers. At the appropriate moment, we'll declare that discovery is not a derelict, but has merely been parked until we can retrieve it. Any attempt to take over the ship would be an act of piracy. I'm sure the Chinese will be most impressed. If they're not, what can we do about it? We outnumber them. And two to one, when we revive Chandra and Kerno. Are you serious? Where are the cutlasses for the boarding party? 
cutlasses, swords, weapons. Oh, we could use a laser telespectrometer that can vaporize milligram asteroid samples at ranges of a thousand kilometers. I'm not sure I like this conversation. My government certainly would not condone violence, except, of course, in self-defense. You naive Americans, we're more realistic. We have to be. All your grandparents died of old age, Haywood. Three of mine were killed in the Great Patriotic War. When they were alone together, Tanya always called him Woody, never Haywood. She must be serious. Or was she merely testing his reactions? Anyway, discovery is merely a few billion dollars worth of hardware. The ship is not important, only the information it carries. Exactly, information that could be copied and then erased. You do get some cheerful ideas, Tanya. Sometimes I think that all Russians are a little paranoid. Thanks to Napoleon and Hitler, we've earned every right to be. But don't tell me that you haven't already worked that, what you call it, scenario out for yourself. It wasn't necessary, Floyd answered rather glumly. The State Department's already done it for me, with variations. We we'll just have to see which one the Chinese come up with. And I wouldn't be in the least surprised if they outguess us again. Dr. Floyd, I know you're aboard Leonoff. I may not have much time. Aiming my suit antenna where I think the signal vanished for agonizing seconds, then came back again much clearer, though not appreciably louder. Relay this information to Earth. Chen destroyed three hours ago. I'm only survivor, using my suit radio. No idea if it has enough range but it's the only chance. Please listen carefully. There is life on Europa. I repeat, there is life on Europa. The signal faded again. There was a stunned silence which no one attempted to interrupt. While he was waiting, Floyd searched his memories furiously. He could not recognize the voice. It might have been that of any Western-educated Chinese. Probably it was someone he had met at a scientific conference but unless the speaker identified himself, he would never know. Soon after local midnight, we were pumping steadily and the tanks were almost half full. Dr. Lee and I went out to check the pipe insulation. Chen stands, stood, about 30 meters from the edge of the Grand Canal. Pipes go directly from it and down through the ice. Very thin, not safe to walk on. The warm-up welling. Again a long silence. Floyd wondered if the speaker was moving and had been momentarily cut off by some obstruction. No problem. Five kilowatts of lighting strung up on the ship. Like a Christmas tree. Beautiful. Shining right through the ice. Glorious colors. Lee saw it first. A huge dark mass rising up from the depths. At first he thought it was a skull of fish. Too large for a single organism. Then it started to break through the ice. Dr. Floyd, I hope you can hear me. This is Professor Chang. We met in 02, Boston IAU conference. Instantly, incongruously, Floyd's thoughts were a billion kilometers away. He vaguely remembered that reception after the closing session of the International Astronomical Union Congress, the last one that the Chinese had attended before the Second Cultural Revolution. And now he recalled Chang very distinctly a small, humorous astronomer and exobiologist with a good fund of jokes. He wasn't joking now. Like huge strands of wet seaweed crawling along the ground, Lee ran back to the ship to get a camera. I stayed to watch, reporting over the radio. The thing moved so slowly I could easily outrun it. I was much more excited than alarmed. I thought I knew what kind of creature it was. I've seen pictures of the kelp forests off California, but I was quite wrong. I could tell it was in trouble. It couldn't possibly survive at a temperature 150 below its normal environment. It was freezing solid as it moved forward. Bits were breaking off like glass, but it was still advancing towards the ship, a black tunnel. I was still so surprised that I couldn't think straight and I couldn't imagine what it was trying to do. 
Is there any way we can call him back? Floyd whispered urgently. No, it's too late. Europa will soon be behind Jupiter. We'll have to wait until it comes out of eclipse. Climbing up the ship, building a kind of ice tunnel as it advanced. Perhaps this was insulating it from the cold, the way termites protect themselves from sunlight with their little corridors of mud. Tons of ice on the ship. The radio antennas broke off first. Then I could see the landing legs beginning to buckle, all in slow motion, like a dream. Not until the ship started to topple did I realize what the thing was trying to do. And then it was too late. We could have saved ourselves if only we'd switched off all those lights. Perhaps it's a phototrope. It's biological cycle triggered by the sunlight that filters through the ice. Or it could have been attracted like a moth to a candle. Our floodlights must have been more brilliant than anything that Europa has ever known. Then the ship crashed. I saw the hull split, a cloud of snowflakes form as moisture condensed. All the lights went out, except for one, swinging back and forth on the cable a couple of meters above the ground. I don't know what happened immediately after that. The next thing I remember, I was standing under the light beside the wreck of the ship with a fine powdering of fresh snow all around me. I could see my footsteps in it very clearly. I must have run there, perhaps only a minute or two had elapsed. The plant, I still thought of it as a plant, was motionless. I wondered if it had been damaged by the impact. Large sections, as thick as a man's arm, had splintered off like broken twigs. Then the main trunk started to move again. It pulled away from the hull and began to crawl towards me. That was when I knew for certain that the thing was light sensitive. I was standing immediately under the thousand watt lamp, which had stopped swinging now. Imagine an oak tree, better still, a banyan with its multiple trunks and roots, flattened out by gravity and trying to creep along the ground. It got to within five meters of the light, then started to spread out until it made a perfect circle around me. Presumably that was a limit of tolerance, the point at which photoattraction turned to repulsion. After that, nothing happened for several minutes. I wondered if it was dead, frozen solid at last. Then I saw that large buds were forming on many of the branches. It was like watching a time-lapse film of flowers. In fact, I thought they were flowers, each about as big as a man's head. Delicate, beautifully colored membranes started to unfold. Even then, it occurred to me that no one, no thing, could ever have seen those colors before. They had no existence until we brought our lights, our fatal lights, to this world. Tendrils, stamens, waving feebly, I walked over to the living wall that surrounded me so that I could see exactly what was happening. Neither then, or at any other time, had I felt the slightest fear of the creature. I was certain that it was not malevolent, if indeed it was conscious at all. There were scores of the big flowers in various stages of unfolding. Now they reminded me of butterflies just emerging from the chrysalis. Wings crumpled, still feeble. I was getting closer and closer to the truth. But they were freezing, dying as quickly as they formed. Then, one after another, they dropped off from the parent buds. For a few moments they flopped around like fish stranded on dry land. And at last I realized exactly what they were. Those membranes weren't petals. They were fins, or their equivalent. This was the free-swimming, larval stage of the creature. Probably it spends much of its life rooted on the seabed, then sends these mobile offspring in search of new territory, just like the corals of Earth's oceans. I kneeled down to get a closer look at one of the little creatures. The beautiful colors were fading now to a drab brown. Some of the petal fins had snapped off, becoming brittle shards as they froze. But it was still moving feebly, and as I approached, it tried to avoid me. I wondered how it sensed my presence. Then I noticed that the stamens, as I'd called them, all carried bright blue dots at their tips. They looked like tiny star sapphires, or the blue eyes along the mantle of a scallop, aware of light, but unable to form true images. As I watched, the vivid blue faded. The sapphires became dull, ordinary stones. 
Dr. Floyd or anyone else who's listening, I haven't much more time. Jupiter will soon block my signal, but I've almost finished. I knew then what I had to do. The cable to that thousand watt lamp was hanging almost to the ground. I gave it a few tugs and the light went out in a shower of sparks. I wondered if it was too late. For a few minutes, nothing happened. So I walked over to the wall of tangled branches round me and kicked it. Slowly, the creature started to unweave itself and to retreat back to the canal. There was plenty of light. I could see everything perfectly. Ganymede and Callisto were in the sky. Jupiter was a huge, thin crescent. And there was a big auroral display on the night side at the Jovian end of the Io flux tube. There was no need to use my helmet light. I followed the creature all the way back to the water, encouraging it with more kicks when it slowed down, feeling the fragments of ice crunching all the time beneath my boots. As it neared the canal, it seemed to gain strength and energy, as if it knew that it was approaching its natural home. I wondered if it would survive to bud again. It disappeared to the surface, leaving a few last dead larvae on the alien land. The exposed free water bubbled for a few minutes until a scab of protective ice sealed it from the vacuum above. Then I walked back to the ship to see if there was anything to salvage. I don't want to talk about that. I have only two requests to make, Doctor. When the taxonomists classify this creature, I hope they'll name it after me. And when the next ship comes here, ask them to take our bones back to China. Jupiter will be cutting us off in a few minutes. I wish I knew whether anyone was receiving me. Anyway, I'll repeat this message when we're in line of sight again, if my suit's life support system lasts that long. This is Professor Chang on Europa, reporting the destruction of spaceship Chen. We landed beside the Grand Canal and set up our pumps at the edge of the ice. The signal faded abruptly, came back for a moment, then disappeared completely below the noise level. Although Leonov listened again on the same frequency, there was no further message from Professor Chang. Hello, Dimitri. This is Woody, switching to key two in five seconds. Unless your computers are a million times faster than ours, and I'm damn sure they're not, no one can decrypt this on your side or mine. But you may have some explaining to do. Anyway, you're good at that. Would you believe that I'm still slightly drunk? We felt we deserved a little party once we successfully rendezvoused, damn it, rendezvoused with Discovery. Besides, we had two new crew members to welcome aboard. Chandra doesn't believe in alcohol. It makes you too human. But Walter Kerno more than made up for him. Only Tanya remains stone cold sober, just as you'd expect. My fellow Americans, I sound like a politician, God help me, came out of hibernation without any problems and are both looking forward to starting work. We'll all have to move quickly. Not only is time running out, but Discovery looks in very bad shape. We could hardly believe our eyes when we saw how its spotless white hull had turned a sickly yellow. I owe us to blame, of course. The ship spiraled down to within 3,000 kilometers. And every few days, one of the volcanoes blasts a few megatons of sulfur up into the sky. Even though you've seen the movies, you can't really imagine what it's like to hang above that inferno. I'll be glad when we can get away, even though we'll be heading towards something much more mysterious, and perhaps far more dangerous. I flew over Killer Air during the 06 eruption. That was mighty scary, but it was nothing, nothing compared to this. At the moment, we're over the night side, and that makes it worse. You can see just enough to imagine a lot more. It's as close to hell as I ever want to get. Some of the sulfur lakes are hot enough to glow visibly, but most of the light comes from electrical discharges. Every few minutes, the whole landscape seems to explode, as if a giant photo flash has gone off above it. And that's probably not a bad analogy. There are millions of amperes flowing in the flux tube linking Io and Jupiter and every so often there's a breakdown. Then you get the biggest lightning flash in the solar system, and half our circuit breakers jump out in sympathy. There's just been an eruption right on the Terminator, and I can see a huge cloud expanding as it comes up towards us, climbing into the sunlight. 
I doubt if it will reach our altitude, and even if it does, it will be harmless by the time it gets here. But it looks ominous. A space monster trying to devour us. Soon after we got here, I realized that Io reminded me of something. It took me a couple of days to work it out. Then I had to check the mission archives, because the ship's library couldn't help. Shame on it. Do you remember how I introduced you to the Lord of the Rings when we were kids back at the Oxford Conference? Well, Io is Mordor. Look up part three. There's a passage about rivers of molten rock that wound their way until they cooled and lay like twisted dragon shapes vomited from the tormented earth. That's a perfect description. How did Tolkien know a quarter of a century before anyone ever saw a picture of Io? Talk about nature imitating art. At least we won't have to land there. I don't think that even our late Chinese colleagues would have attempted that. But perhaps one day it may be possible. There are areas that seem fairly stable and not continually inundated by sulfur floods. Who would have believed that we'd come all the way to Jupiter, graces of planets, and then ignore it? If that's what we're doing most of the time, and when we're not looking at Io or Discovery, we're thinking about the artifact. It's still 10,000 kilometers away, up there at the liberation point. But when I look at it through the main telescope, it seems close enough to touch. Because it's so completely featureless, there's no indication of size. No way the eye can judge it's really a couple of kilometers long. If it's solid, it must weigh billions of tons. But is it solid? It gives almost no radar echo, even when it's square on to us. We can see it only as a black silhouette against the clouds of Jupiter, 300,000 kilometers below. Apart from its size, it looks exactly like the monolith we dug up on the moon. Well, tomorrow we'll go aboard Discovery. and I don't know when I'll have time or opportunity to speak to you again. But there's one more thing, old friend, before I sign off. It's Caroline. She never really understood why I had to leave Earth. And in a way, I don't think she's ever quite forgiven me. Some women believe that love isn't the only thing, but everything. Perhaps they're right. Anyway, it's certainly too late to argue now. Try and cheer her up when you have a chance. She talks about going back to the mainland. I'm afraid that if she does, if you can't get through to her, try to cheer up Chris. I miss him more than I care to say. He'll believe Uncle Dimitri if you say that his father still loves him and will be coming home just as quickly as he can. It was as if he was awakening from a dream, or a dream within a dream. The gate between the stars had brought him back to the world of men, but no longer as a man. How long had he been away? A whole lifetime, no two lifetimes, one forward, one in reverse. As David Bowman, commander and last surviving crew member of United States Spaceship Discovery, he had been caught in a gigantic trap set three million years ago and triggered to respond only at the right time and to the right stimulus. He had fallen through it from one universe to another, meeting wonders some of which he now understood, others which he might never comprehend. He had raced at ever accelerating speed down infinite corridors of light until he had outraced light itself. That, he knew, was impossible, but he also knew how it could be done. As Einstein had rightly said, the good Lord was subtle, but never malicious. He had passed through a cosmic switching system, a grand central station of the galaxies, and emerged, protected from its fury by unknown forces, close to the surface of a giant red star. There he had witnessed the paradox of sunrise on the face of a sun when the dying star's brilliant white dwarf companion had climbed into its sky, a searing apparition drawing a tidal wave of fire beneath it. He had felt no fear, but only wonder, even when his space pod had carried him down into the inferno below. To arrive, beyond all reason, in a beautifully appointed hotel suite 
containing nothing that was not wholly familiar. However, much of it was fake. The books on the shelves were dummies. The cereal boxes and the cans of beer in the icebox, though they bore famous labels, all contained the same bland food with texture like bread, but a taste which was almost anything he cared to imagine. He had quickly realized that he was a specimen in a cosmic zoo, his cage carefully recreated from the images in old television programs, and he wondered when his keepers would appear and in what physical form. How foolish that expectation had been. He knew now that one might as well hope to see the wind or speculate about the true shape of fire. That exhaustion of mind and body had overwhelmed him. For the last time, David Bowman slept. It was a strange sleep, for he was not wholly unconscious. Like a fog creeping through a forest, something invaded his mind. He sensed it only dimly, for the full impact would have destroyed him as swiftly and surely as the fires raging round him. Beneath its dispassionate scrutiny, he felt neither hope nor fear. Sometimes in that long sleep, he dreamed he was awake. Years had gone by. Once he was looking in a mirror at a wrinkled face he barely recognized as his own. His body was racing towards its dissolution. The hands of the biological clock spinning madly towards the midnight they would never reach. For the last moment, time came to a halt and reversed itself. The springs of memory were being tapped. In controlled recollection, he was reliving the past, being drained of knowledge and experience as he swept back towards his childhood. But nothing was being lost. All that he had ever been, at every moment of his life, was being transferred to safer keeping. Even as one David Bowman ceased to exist, another became immortal, passing beyond the necessities of matter. He was an embryo god, not yet ready to be born. For ages he floated in limbo, knowing what he had been, but not what he had become. He was still in a state of flux, somewhere between chrysalis and butterfly, or perhaps only between caterpillar and chrysalis. And then the stasis was broken. Time re-entered his little world. The black rectangular slab that suddenly appeared before him was like an old friend. He had seen it on the moon. He had encountered it in orbit around Jupiter. And he knew, somehow, that his ancestors had met it long ago. Though it held still unfathomed secrets, it was no longer a total mystery. Some of its powers he now understood. He realized that it was not one, but multitudes, and that whatever measuring instruments might say, it was always the same size, as large as necessary. How obvious now was that mathematical ratio of its sides, the quadratic sequence one, four, nine. And how naive to have imagined that the series ended here in only three dimensions. Even as his mind focused upon these geometrical simplicities, the empty rectangle filled with stars. The hotel suite, if indeed it had ever really existed, dissolved back into the mind of its creator, and there before him was the luminous whirlpool of the galaxy. It might have been some beautiful, incredibly detailed model embedded in a block of plastic, but it was the reality now grasped by him as a whole with senses more subtle than vision. If he wished, he could focus his attention on any one of its hundred billion stars. Here he was, adrift in this great river of suns, halfway between the banked fires of the galactic core and the lonely, scattered sentinel stars of the rim. And there was his origin, on the far side of this chasm in the sky, this serpentine band of darkness, empty of all stars. He knew that this formless chaos, visible only by the glow that limbed its edges from fire mists far beyond, was the still unused stuff of creation, the raw material of evolutions yet to be. Here, time had not yet begun. 
not until the suns that now burned were long since dead would light and life reshape this void. Unwittingly, he had crossed it once, now far better prepared, though still wholly ignorant of the impulse that drove him. He must cross it again. The galaxy burst forth from the mental frame in which he had enclosed it. Stars and nebulae poured past him in an illusion of infinite speed. Phantom suns exploded and fell behind as he slipped like a shadow through their cores. The stars were thinning out, the glare of the Milky Way dimming into a pale ghost of the glory he had known and might one day know again. He was back in the space that men called real, at the very point he had left it seconds or centuries ago. He was vividly aware of his surroundings and far more conscious than in that earlier existence of a myriad sensory inputs from the external world. He could focus upon any one of them and scrutinize it in virtually limitless detail until he confronted the fundamental granular structure of time and space below which there was only chaos. And he could move, though he did not know how. But had he ever really known that, even when he possessed a body, the chain of command from brain to limb was a mystery to which he had never given any thought. An effort of will and the spectrum of that nearby star shifted towards the blue by precisely the amount he wished. He was falling towards it at a large fraction of the speed of light. Though he could go faster if he desired, he was in no hurry. There was still much information to be processed, much to be considered, and much more to be won. That he knew was his present goal, but he also knew that it was only part of some far wider plan to be revealed in due course. He gave no thought to the gateway between universes dwindling so swiftly behind him, or to the anxious entities gathered around it in their primitive spacecraft. They were part of his memories, but stronger ones were calling him now, calling him home to the world he had never thought to see again. He could hear his myriad voices growing louder and louder, as it too was growing from a star almost lost against the sun's outstretched corona to a slim crescent and finally to a glorious blue-white disk. They knew that he was coming. Down there on that crowded globe, the alarms would be flashing across the radar screens, the great tracking telescopes would be searching the skies, and history as men had known it would be drawing to a close. A thousand kilometers below, he became aware that a slumbering cargo of death had awoken and was stirring in its orbit. The feeble energies it contained were no possible menace to him. Indeed, he could profitably use them. He entered the maze of circuitry and swiftly traced the way to its lethal core. Most of the branchings could be ignored. They were blind alleys, devised for protection. Beneath his scrutiny, their purpose was childishly simple. It was easy to bypass them all. Now there was a single last barrier, a crude but effective mechanical relay holding apart two contacts. Until they were closed, there would be no power to activate the final sequence. He put forth his will, and for the first time, knew failure and frustration. The few grams of the micro switch would not budge. He was still a creature of pure energy, as yet, the world of inert matter was beyond his grasp. Well, there was a simple answer to that. He still had much to learn. The current pulse he induced in the relay was so powerful that it almost melted the coil before it could operate the trigger mechanism. The microseconds ticked slowly by. It was interesting to observe the explosive lenses focus their energies, like the feeble match that ignites a powder train that in turn the megatons flowered in a silent detonation that brought a brief false dawn to half the sleeping world. Like a phoenix rising from the flames, he absorbed what he needed and discarded the rest. Far below, the shield of the atmosphere, which protected the planet from so many hazards, absorbed the most dangerous of the radiation. But there would be some unlucky men and animals who would never see again. In the aftermath of the explosion, it seemed as if the earth was struck dumb. 
the babble of the short and medium waves was completely silenced, reflected back by the suddenly enhanced ionosphere. Only the microwave still sliced through the invisible and slowly dissolving mirror that now surrounded the planet, and most of these were too tightly beamed for him to receive them. A few high-powered radars were still focused upon him, but that was a matter of no importance. He did not even bother to neutralize them, as he could easily have done. And if any more bombs came his way, he would treat them with equal indifference. For the present, he had all the energy he needed. And now he was descending, in great sweeping spirals, towards the lost landscape of his childhood. Now the long wait was ending. On yet another world, intelligence had been born and was escaping from its planetary cradle. An ancient experiment was about to reach its climax. Those who had begun that experiment so long ago had not been men or even remotely human, but they were flesh and blood, and when they looked at across the deeps of space, they had felt awe and wonder and loneliness. As soon as they possessed the power, they set forth for the stars. In their explorations, they encountered life in many forms and watched the workings of evolution on a thousand worlds. They saw how often the first faint sparks of intelligence flickered and died in the cosmic night. And because, in all the galaxy, they had found nothing more precious than mind, they encouraged its dawning everywhere. They became farmers in the fields of stars. They sowed, and sometimes they reaped. And sometimes, dispassionately, they had to weed. The great dinosaurs had long since perished when the survey ship entered the solar system after a voyage that had already lasted a thousand years. It swept past the frozen outer planets, paused briefly above the deserts of dying Mars, and presently looked down on Earth. Spread out beneath them, the explorers saw a world swarming with life. For years they studied, collected, catalogued. When they had learned all that they could, they began to modify. They tinkered with the destiny of many species on land and in the ocean. But which of their experiments would succeed, they could not know for at least a million years. They were patient, but they were not yet immortal. There was so much to do in this universe of a hundred billion suns, and other worlds were calling. So they set out once more into the abyss, knowing that they would never come this way again. Nor was there any need. The service they had left behind them would do the rest. On Earth, the glaciers came and went, while above them the changeless moon still carried its secret. With a yet slower rhythm than the polar ice, the tides of civilization ebbed and flowed across the galaxy. Strange and beautiful and terrible empires rose and fell and passed on their knowledge to their successors. Earth was not forgotten, but another visit would serve little purpose. It was one of a million silent worlds, few of which would ever speak. And now, out among the stars, evolution was driving towards new goals. The first explorers of Earth had long since come to the limits of flesh and blood. As soon as their machines were better than their bodies, it was time to move. First their brains, and then their thoughts alone, they transferred into shining new homes of metal and plastic. In these, they roamed among the stars. They no longer built spaceships. They were spaceships, but the age of the machine entities swiftly passed. In their ceaseless experimenting, they had learned to store knowledge in the structure of space itself and to preserve their thoughts for eternity in frozen lattices of light. They could become creatures of radiation, free at last from the tyranny of matter. Into pure energy, therefore, they presently transformed themselves, and on a thousand worlds, the empty shells they had discarded twitched for a while in a mindless dance of death then crumbled into rust. Now they were lords of the galaxy and beyond the reach of time. They could rove at will among the stars 
and sink like a subtle mist through the very interstices of space. But despite their godlike powers, they had not wholly forgotten their origin in the warm slime of a vanished sea. And they still watched over the experiments their ancestors had started so long ago. Epilogue 20,001 Only during the last few generations had the Europans ventured into the far side, beyond the light and warmth of their never-setting sun, into the wilderness where the ice which once covered all their world may still be found. And even fewer have remained there to face the brief and fearful night that comes when the brilliant but powerless cold sun sinks below the horizon. Yet already those few hardy explorers have discovered that the universe around them is stranger than they ever imagined. The sensitive eyes they develop in the dim ocean still serve them well. They can see the stars and the other bodies moving in their sky. They have begun to lay the foundations of astronomy, and some daring thinkers have even surmised that the great world of Europa is not the whole of creation. Very soon after they had emerged from the ocean, during the explosively swift evolution forced upon them by the melting of the ice, they had realized that the objects in the sky fell into three distinct classes. Most important, of course, was the sun. Some legends, though few took them seriously, claimed that it had not always been there, but it appeared suddenly, holding a brief cataclysmic age of transformation when much of Europa's teeming life had been destroyed. If this was indeed true, it was a small price to pay for the benefits that poured down from the tiny, inexhaustible source of energy that hung unmoving in the sky. Perhaps the cold sun was his distant brother, banished for some crime and condemned to march forever round the vault of heaven. It was of no importance except to those peculiar Europeans who were always asking questions about matters that all sensible folk took for granted. Still, it must be admitted that these cranks had made some interesting discoveries during the excursions into the darkness of Farside. They claimed, though this was hard to believe, that the whole sky was sprinkled with uncountable myriads of tiny lights, even smaller and feebler than the cold sun. They varied greatly in brilliance, and they never moved. Against this background, there were three objects which did move, apparently obeying complex laws which no one had yet been able to fathom. And unlike all the others in the sky, they were quite large, though both shape and size varied continually. Sometimes there were disks, sometimes half circles, sometimes slim crescents. They were obviously closer than all the other bodies in the universe, for their surfaces showed an immense wealth of complex and ever-changing detail. The theory that they were indeed other worlds had at last been accepted, though no one, except a few fanatics, believed that they could be anything like as large or as important as Europa. One lay towards the sun, and was in a constant state of turmoil. On its night side could be seen the glow of great fires, a phenomenon still beyond the understanding of the Europans, for their atmosphere, as yet, contains no oxygen. And sometimes vast explosions hurled clouds of debris up from the surface. If the sunward globe is indeed a world, it must be a very unpleasant place to live, perhaps even worse than the night side of Europa. The two outer and more distant spheres seem to be much less violent places, yet in some ways they are even more mysterious. When darkness falls upon their surfaces, they too show patches of light, but these are very different from the swiftly changing fires of the turbulent inner world. They burn with an almost steady brilliance and are concentrated in a few small areas, though over the generations these areas have grown and multiplied. But strangest of all are the lights, fierce as tiny suns, that can often be observed moving across the darkness between these other worlds. Once, recalling the bioluminescence of their own seas, some Europeans have speculated that these might indeed be living creatures, but their intensity makes that almost incredible. Nevertheless, 
more and more thinkers believe that these lights, the fixed patterns and the moving suns, must be some strange manifestation of life. Against this, however, there is one very potent argument. If they are living things, why do they never come to Europa? Yet there are legends. Thousands of generations ago, soon after the conquest of the land, it is said that some of these lights came very close indeed, but they always exploded in sky-fitting blasts that far outshone the sun and strange hard metals rained down from the land. Some of them are still worshipped to this day. None is as holy, though, as the huge black monolith that stands on the frontier of eternal day, one side forever turned towards the unmoving sun, the other facing to the land of night. Ten times the height of the tallest European, even when he raises his tendrils to the fullest extent, it is the very symbol of mystery and untainability but has never been touched. It can only be worshipped from afar. Around it lies a circle of power which repels all who try to approach. It is that same power, many believe, that keeps at bay those moving lights in the sky. If it ever fails, they will descend upon the virgin continents and shrinking seas of Europa, and their purpose will at last be revealed. The Europans would be surprised to know with what intensity and baffled wonder that black monolith is also studied by the minds behind those moving lights. For centuries now, their instruments have watched it from space, and ever and again an automatic probe has made a cautious descent from orbit, always with the same disastrous result. For until the time is ripe, the monolith will permit no contact. When that time comes, when perhaps the Europans have invented radio and discovered the messages continually bombarding them from so close at hand, the monolith may change its strategy. It may, or it may not, choose to release the entities who slumber within it so that they can bridge the gulf between the Europans and the race to which they once held allegiance. And it may be that no such bridge is possible and that two such alien forms of consciousness can never coexist. If this is so, then only one of them can inherit the solar system, which it will be, not even the gods know, yet.